<laughs> well, welcome everybody. It's good to see you all. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Father B.J. Burricker. Um, I'm the Associate Rector for Mission and Pastoral Care at All Saints Church in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, I've been in this role two and a half years, something like that at this point. I don't know. Um, before that, I uh, worked at Catholic University. Um, I was the Associate Dean of their School of Continuing Education. So I got to work with um, lots of just wonderful students trying to finish up their degrees um, later on in life um, and really help facilitate a lot of what I'm doing now and the way I interact with people. Um, and I think this past year has been awful because one of the things I love to do the most is meet with folks and be with them in times of need. Um, just love being there, you know, with the you know, hospital bed or, you know, when people are grieving or whatever it happens to be. So Lord willing, we'll get over this pandemic sooner than later. Bit more about my background, in case you didn't read the ridiculously long email I sent yesterday. Um, um, I've got a PhD in biblical studies, um, and when I was going through seminary, uh, it was a class on Hebrew poetry, of which the books of wisdom um, fall into, that made me want to study scripture kind of full time. I absolutely love this stuff, um, and it's just fascinating um, to read, to discuss, and all of that. Um, so what is most likely going to be a problem with uh, the presentation is I'm long-winded and will be here till tomorrow morning. Um, so um, please feel free to ask questions the way I would much prefer to do this. I do have PowerPoint slides, which for the most part, I despise PowerPoint. I wish we were kind of at a table or in a classroom so that you could raise your hands, you could interrupt, you could do something when you've got questions uh, or whatever. So do feel free to do that. If, if we're going through something and, and you've got a question, hit the little hands up uh, button or type something in the chat, because uh, I'd really love to discuss that and some of the things um, that... Uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to actually turn it over to you guys and ask you particular questions, uh, which I'll start with. So I'm curious, have you all, what's been your experience with the books of wisdom? And typically that's defined in the Hebrew Bible as um, Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. And then if you read the apocryphal books or the deuterocanonical books, that'll also include Sirach and the wisdom of Solomon. <clears throat> so I'm curious if you've read any, all of these, what your thoughts are, what they've meant to you. seeing people shaking heads. I'll start. I have no problem. Um, <laughs> haven't, ha haven't read them and um, haven't, I mean, I've heard of them um, probably uh, very few, but not really kind of even touch. I know they exist in the Bible. There you go. They're in there <laughs> because I've seen them, but <laughs> I haven't really been exposed to them. Okay, great. Anybody else? I have not really read um, read any of them. Um, I think I've probably read parts of Job, but um, yeah, this is all sort of new to me. I'm looking forward to learning. Oh, good. I'm glad. Job is a hard book, especially if you try and pick it up and read all the way through. You'll get through the first two chapters and go, this is really interesting. And then you'll get to the fourth and go, what? What just happened? Um, and then unless you skip to the end, you're going to be in that what stage for quite a long time. Yeah, Catherine, it looked like you were going to share. Well, I was just going to agree with what other people said. I haven't uh, done a lot of Bible study anyway, but and so I really haven't read too many. I did, because you said you're going to start with Proverbs. I kind of flipped through it last night. And, uh, and some of the Proverbs are like sort of famous. And I've heard of them, but, you know, I didn't know that's where they came from necessarily. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. This morning, my friend sent me a quote from Proverbs. So I was like, oh, Proverbs. And right, it was so the thing it. About, about a good wife and all the things this good wife was doing. And I thought, oh, Lord, way too busy, girl. You'll never get <laughs> down. But that's about it. I mean, I know that we have read them occasionally, but not real often or real seriously. Yeah, and you don't often hear, you know, sermons. Every once in a while, I'll hear a sermon on Job. Yeah. Maybe once on some of the early chapters of Proverbs. And I don't, I've given a sermon on Ecclesiastes, but I've never heard a sermon on Ecclesiastes. Oh. Um, so there, that's where you have it with that. So all that's very good. Um, so it sounds like we're all learning together here. Then that, That's fantastic. 
Um, so tonight, my, my goals really are is to talk about first, what is wisdom, and then to do somewhat of an overview of Proverbs. And I'll be honest, up front, out of all of these books, this and Ecclesiastes are kind of the two that are really tough to kind of outline and put your way through, especially when you get to the second portion of Proverbs, because it just feels like it's a whole bunch of random sayings and things like that. Um, so I'll talk about and give you some strategies on how to maybe approach the book and think through it as we go through. But first, and I guess I'll start my slideshow since I have one, um, and we'll see if I keep up with that or not. Um, oh, I'm pushing too many buttons. Back up here. Um, and go through, and then I'll ask other questions that I actually have in the slideshow as we're getting started. Um, be amazed at my PowerPoint abilities here. Isn't that beautiful? Um, and then, so the big question is, what is wisdom? And I thought about breaking this up into small groups and to breakout sessions to talk about this, but I'll just ask them here. Who is the wisest person in your life? And feel free, anybody just kind of shout it out, jump in. My friend Donna. <laughs> Your friend Donna. All right. And what makes her wise? Um, I think um, she has a lot of um, good common sense. Um, she has a lot of um, experience and knowledge that I think, um, you know, she's kind of put together. Maybe I don't know that she's done it consciously. But she just has, you know, um, a, a very good perspective on things. And she makes good decisions and judgments. Excellent. Great. So common sense, good judgment, good perspective, experience. Excellent. What else? Uh, somebody else. I would like to say that not just in my life, but as a, as a whole, I think the wiser person is usually humble. It doesn't, mm. it doesn't assume, and he or she uh, needs to be somewhat of a good listener. That's really good. I like that. Yeah, good listener, humble. Um, and to some degree, that almost goes back to Socrates, who basically said, you know, the person who is wise is the person who thinks he is not wise. Um, yeah. And when you realize you don't know things, that, that's when you really know it, which I think means I'm the smartest person on earth because there's all sorts of stuff I don't know. Um, yeah, somebody else. Well, I can honestly say I just read the um, Wisdom of Solomon, and I am the last person who is wise. I am one big fool, and I loved that book. Yeah, I learned so much from it. I, I, I wish it was in every Bible. Me too. It's a beautiful book. Absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah, fantastic. So if you to put in a sentence or two, how would you define wisdom? Maybe why is it important? Knowledge applied. Knowledge applied. I like that. Yeah, it's not just knowing stuff. but That's from the book of Proverbs, though, at <laughs> the introduction. That's okay. You, you read it. <laughs> you can cheat in my class. <laughs> no, that's good. And one of the examples I have of that was when I was in, um, I guess, early high school. There was a girl in one of my classes who just got her license and she had the worst sense of direction ever. She couldn't remember how to get from point A to point B at all. And this is before you have smartphones and GPS and all of that. And so what she did is she had a bunch of cards on the console of her car on how to get from her house to Susie's house, on how to get from her house to Giant, on how to get from Susie's house to Giant and back again and all of those type of things. And it was she knew what her flaws were, she had the knowledge, and it was a matter of applying it in the right way and kind of getting over those things. Yeah, one more person on this. Um, it seems like it's uh, insight based on experience. Insight based on experience. Yeah. That's really good. And that's getting really close to what we're gonna see here as we look through the Old Testament. Um, Cause I've got, you know, the whole question is what is wisdom? And in looking at the Old Testament, there are two words. I'm sure we all read Hebrew, and this is going to be deeply meaningful to all of you. Um, but chokmah and chakam. Chokmah means wisdom. Chakam means wise. And as you can see, these two words together show up over 300 times in the Old Testament. And they're really important as they define 
and describe different people. Often these words are used in the Psalms and in Proverbs and in other places exactly as the way you've used them, you know, with knowledge or skill, instruction, or as Robin just said, insight. Um, as you go through and you flip through the different stories of the Old Testament, the word shows up in places where you honestly may not expect it to. And I'll give you a few examples here, and I don't know how they get the uh, handout, Rowan, um, but in the handout that I've got, I've got a couple more examples. But one is it's used of tailors, that tailors themselves are very wise. And these are the tailors um, as Moses is receiving instructions on how to build the tabernacle and make the garments and the vestments for the priests. He's told to find highly skilled, wise tailors. That's interesting. You have Joseph and his amazing technicolor dream coat. And he's called wise. Why? Because he interprets dreams. He was able to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh's uh, cupbearer and baker. And then um, when he's brought up to Pharaoh himself and Pharaoh has a dream, he's able to um, uh, interpret that as well. Um, another example, a bit more nefarious, is from Jonadab. And this comes from one of the um, less clean stories, shall we say, of the Old Testament. Uh, one of David's sons, Amnon, is madly in love with his half-sister, Tamar, and he wants to lie with her. So he goes and tries to find a scheme to put this together, and he finds a very crafty man. Uh, says he's a wise man. Um, this man, Jonadab, who basically says, pretend to be sick, ask Tamar to come and wait on you, and when she comes in, then you can have your way with her. Not exactly the wisdom perhaps we should aspire to, but that's the word that's used to describe him. And then finally, another example that's rather interesting is it's used to describe the Egyptians. At the beginning of Exodus, as we find out that the Hebrew people have grown and become very numerous in Egypt, the Egyptians are worried that the Israelites are going to overwhelm them. And so they say, let's be wise. Let's be shrewd and come up with a scheme. Let's make their work so hard and miserable they're going to be exhausted and unable to do this, and so the work gets harder. Fascinating that these words are used in so many different contexts. But when you think of wisdom in the Old Testament, the person to think through, it, think of is wise old Solomon, King Solomon here. And it's used numerous times of Solomon himself. And yet again, is it's not always in the way you would think it would happen. One way that it's used is... Um, with regard to his knowledge of arts and science. Um, in 1 Kings 4, it says that he's one of the most wise people to ever live. And he wrote 1,500 proverbs, and he wrote a 1,000 songs, and he could talk about plants and trees and animals and all sorts of things. And so we might see this as artistic skill, scientific knowledge, and insight. David, when he's on his deathbed, is having a conversation with Solomon and passing on what Solomon should do. And he basically says, Solomon, you need to get revenge on my enemies. And so he mentions Joab, who was David's kind of right-hand man and chief general, but who was rather nefarious in his dealings and killed one of David's sons. And he says, do what you want with him, but use your wisdom and don't let his gray head go down into the grave uh, in peace. And he says something similar with a man named Shimei, or with respect to a man named Shimei, um, who had uh, cursed David. And so Solomon is told to use his wisdom in dealing with these people. A very famous story, if you know the story of the two prostitutes um, and their, their children. Uh, these two prostitutes are living together. They both have children, uh, infants about the same age. And one of them in the middle of the night rolls over and smothers her own child but takes the other as her own. There's obviously a dispute about who the child belongs to. They go to Solomon, and in his wisdom, his solution is get a sword, chop the baby in half, you each get half of it, and we'll all be happy. To which the real mother of the child says, no, 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 don't do that. Let her have the baby. That way he can live. And Solomon, in his wisdom, now knows which one is the true mother. And where does Solomon get all of this wisdom? Well, it comes to him in a dream. God appears to him and says, ask what you want, and I will give it to you. And rather than asking for riches or power or lots of other earthly things, 
He says he wants a listening heart so that he can govern the people justly. A listening heart to govern them justly. And it's here that in hearing that, God says, I will grant you wisdom as you have requested. And on top of that, I'll give you power. I'll give you wealth and all these other things. But it comes down to him being able to govern justly. So in one of the resources I've recommended from John McLaughlin, um, he has a couple of definitions about looking at all these different ways that wisdom is used in the Old Testament. And he says, in general, it's the skill necessary to accomplish the task at hand. And as we've seen, it can be something as mundane as being a tailor, something as important as ruling a kingdom, or something as nefarious as concocting a way for a man to have his way with a woman that he shouldn't be with. More specifically to how it's frequently used in wisdom literature is wisdom is how to relate to nature, inanimate things, other people, and even God properly and profitably, right? And so it's very relational, as you see, and it's doing things the right way at the right time with the right motive um, and all of these different types of things so that you behave appropriately and perhaps morally, um, but also profitably so that you get the result that you want. And so again, you could use wisdom of being a farmer. You could use wisdom to describe a king and you could use wisdom, you know, obviously of Yoda um, and various other people who just know things and know how to apply them in the right way. Then goes on like, this is great, love wisdom, I want wisdom, how do you get it? And many of you have already mentioned a lot of the ways that you would do that. And here are some ways that you would get wisdom. Obviously you can get it from sages and people who are smarter than you, who've had more experience. You could go to other cultures, uh, but I've got in parentheses there, Amenemope. Um, Amenemope uh, was an Egyptian uh, wise man, and he highly influenced Proverbs chapters 22 through 24. And if you compare Amenemope's writings with Proverbs, Proverbs may not pass muster and turn it in, if you're familiar with that in higher education. Um, there seems to be a lot of borrowing and copying from there. Obviously, your parents, and there's a lot in Proverbs of, my son, listen to your father's teaching. Um, you know, don't reject your mother's instruction. Your old observations. Um, and there's several places in Proverbs where um, it'll point to nature and say, look at the ant. See how hardworking the ant is. That's how we should be, right? And you get kind of the sense of Aesop's fables. Right? And we do this all the time, you know, in our things, you know, he's as sly as a fox, as busy as a beaver, you know, busy bee, and you put these things up as um, models, perhaps, that you should uh, emulate. There's an awful lot about experience, and I think that was one of the things um, that was said about Donna, um, the, the friend Donna, is she's had such great experience and has learned so much from her experience, and in Ecclesiastes, in the first couple of chapters, that's highly what influences that, is, um, is his experience. In Deuteronomy, it basically says, if you keep all the words of my instructions, you will be wise. So we can get wisdom from Torah, or we could expand that perhaps to all of sacred scripture um, as we interact with it, as we engage it. And then, of course, we can get it from God, you know, directly from God, just like Solomon did. And so what's interesting in all of this is, you'll, if you, you notice, there's kind of a bottom-up approach as well as a top-down approach. So you can get wisdom just from where we are and build it up that way from our experience, the people around us and so on. But it can also come down from us from God on high and be granted to us and bless us that way. And so that's, um, I, I think, kind of what to pay attention to here. So I'm gonna stop because I think that's a mouthful already. Are there questions at this point that you all might have? Comments, rebuttals, rotten tomatoes? I mean, I can keep talking. That's no problem. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, here. Um, so I'll bring it back up then. So that's kind of what wisdom is and where we get it and kind of what to think about. And so as we approach the wisdom literature, then the whole point of it is really to make us wise. And that makes lots of sense, right? Why would you put all these proverbs together? Why would you have a book like Job or Ecclesiastes when we get there? It's to make you wise, to make you be able to engage in this world in a way that's proper and productive and, and, 
profitable for you and for those around you. And what's interesting about it is these books do it, in my opinion, in conversation with each other. And so I think we should read them that way. Um, in the Tanakh, in the Jewish Bible, Job comes immediately after Proverbs. And I think that's intentional. So you read Proverbs, which is a rather positive book, followed by Job, which is most definitely not. And I think that's intentional um, because as we'll see as we go through Proverbs, is it really kind of gives you an ideal picture and the way you kind of want the world to work. And then you come to Job and it's like, but this is the way it actually does. And so what do we do with this and how are these books in conversation with each other? All right, uh, one more chance for questions. Oh yeah, Sorry. no. <laughs> Sorry, I was writing it in the chat. Um, are there specific authors for the various books or? Aha. <laughs> Good question, Mildred. <laughs> um, although to, to honestly answer your question, it really comes down to we don't know um, for sure exactly who wrote most of these books. So traditionally, when you turn to Proverbs, it's usually attributed to Solomon, and he reigned 966 to 926, more or less BCE. But more than likely, especially from other cultural influence, is that these Proverbs were compiled over centuries. And it's interesting, other authors are mentioned in the book of Proverbs, and we quite frankly don't know who they are. Um, so there's a section, um, you know, the, uh, let's see, the words of Agor, son of Jacket. I have no idea who that is, um, but somehow his works ended up in the book and so on. But what we see kind of from the context here in the book, especially in several parts where it talks about, my son, don't forget your father's instruction. It seems like it's written from a father to a son and quite possibly a child being raised in the royal court. Um, so we kind of possibly have that context. And so when you start seeing things about the way the king should behave or what we should expect the king to do or not do or whatever, that's possibly because this child is being raised either to be king or a governor or a servant within the court or something along those lines. And this also helps explain why the, um, both the protagonist and antagonist of the book are feminine. Um, so you have Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly, and you have the strange woman who's a seductress. Well, that makes sense if you're writing to a male child. Um, you don't want him to go astray and be seduced by the dark side of folly. And so you make the dark side look feminine and you don't want to go to that. Look at the more beautiful woman and, you know, rejoice in the wife of your youth. Pursue Lady Wisdom because, you know, her, um, the benefit of her far outweighs this adulterous encounter you might have. Uh, Pete, you've got a question. Uh, yeah. Um, am I unmuted? I hope. Yes. Yeah, good, thanks. Well, my question is, uh, you know, this past year, two years now, uh, there are so many voices that we're hearing uh, and so much good news and bad news and not news. And so uh, on that list that we saw in the previous uh, slide, uh, I think you made reference to the fact, to something that led me to believe that the list was going down and then coming back up with God being at the bottom. Um, so my question basically is, uh, I'm a CPA, so it has to be kind of linear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so how do, how, do I, how do I take my wisdom accumulated in 81 years and apply it to the learning of wisdom through, the, uh, through this process? if you understand what I'm trying to say. If I, I, not, I'll ask it in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think so. And first of all, God bless you for your profession. Dear heavens, that's, <laughs> that's a job and a half and possibly. Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I love you guys. Um, and if, if for no other reason, I don't have to do what you do because you're already doing it. Um, so thank you for that. But yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to, and I'm guessing as you look through your life, as you'll look back and go, man, I thought I was wise in my 40s. But what I've yeah. learned since then is this. Um, and I heard a comedian one time saying, you know, when you're 16, you think you know it all. And then you're 18 and you look back and go, boy, I was a doofus. 
then you get to be 21 and you do it. He goes, does this continue all the way up? So, you know, when you're 95, you look back at 90 and go, oh boy, I've matured a lot since then. Um, but I think there is a lot of that and it's because you get some of these voices. And I think through experience, you're able to see which voices are indeed wise and good and which ones aren't. And that's never a perfect mm -hmm. process, of course, because we're not perfect. Um, but through conversation, through interaction, through experience, you kind of start realizing these things work, these things don't. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, even taking and um, you know Excel formulas and things like that, and trying to do different stuff there. So much of it's trial and error. You learn from the manual, but until you start typing it in, who knows? Um, and stuff like that. And so I, I think that's how I would answer to say, you know, as you go through and you hear all these different voices you've got to test it by what you already know. Um, and I didn't necessarily mean that God's at the bottom of all of this. In fact, I would say God should be at the top. Um, right. Um, I would so find that I should be the case. my list here. Um, pretend the slide's upside down. Just do it that Yeah, way. I, I kind of viewed it that way. And, um, and I think that's your, right. To answer, that's the way I see it. Uh, but to answer your original introductory question, uh, I actually look to my grandchildren who are uh, in their adolescent years, and I find so much of their thinking is what, what I classify as wisdom. Mm. Uh, because basically, it seems to me as though their, their thought patterns, their brain, whatever you want to call it, their soul has not been modified. It is still in its pure form. Mm. So that you are getting an unfiltered uh, response to the question of uh, who is wise and what is wisdom, if that makes any sense. No, it makes a lot of sense. No, and I, yeah, I think that's good. Um, and having some of that yeah, unfiltered stuff is good. And yet, then again, over time, you somewhat learn when you need to be filtered, um, when, when you need not to be. Um, for right. the second time this week, I'll quote this from my big fat Greek wedding. Um, if, if you've seen that from years ago is, uh, uh -huh. you know, when the father's like, you know, the, the, the husband is the head of the household. She's like, yes, yeah. the husband's the head, the woman's the <laughs> neck. She can turn that head any direction she wants to go. Um, <laughs> and there's kind of a sense it's like, you know, over time as you figure out wh where to turn it, when not to turn it, yeah. how, to, how to get your way in the, the proper, not necessarily being manipulative, but going, yeah. this is the right course of action. But if I say it bluntly, we're not going to get anywhere, you know, and you could think of somebody, you know, who's going to say substance abuse and say, you know, if I, if I hit it dead on, they're probably going to reject me and go somewhere else. I've got to do this a bit softer and a bit wiser and things like that. And so figure out when to turn the filter off. And then the person who can come to you and be like, dude, you are messing up and you need to yeah. get your act again. Um, yeah. And I've got friends, you know, in both ways. And because of over time and the way the relationship has developed, they know they can confront me head on and it'll be fine tomorrow. And yeah. they've done that at really important and at really good times in my life. And I've appreciated that. Um, right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. I appreciate sure. that. No, very good. Good question. All right. So this gives a bit of an overview. And I, for almost anything I teach, I'm, I don't spend that much time on authorship and dates. So unless there's questions here, I'm gonna move on from this. But I'm more interested in what the stuff actually says. Um, and so coming here to the structure of the book, and there are two main sections of the book of Proverbs. The first nine chapters and then chapters 10 through 31. And again, in the handout, I've got this a bit more detailed than what I'll put here. So you can look at it, especially for the first nine. Um, and I would basically break it up every time as it tells you that there's an author where it says the Proverbs of so-and-so or the words of the wise or the words of so-and-so. That's where I'd put a section break, a main section break. And so in these first nine chapters, more or less the main message is that wisdom is far better than folly. Um, and we're going to look a bit more deeply at that here in just a bit. Um, but wisdom is far better than folly. After that, you get into what you probably consider Proverbs to be, these short, pithy, pointed statements about life, about relationships, about the wisdom of God, and about other things. But it is worth mentioning how diverse this is. Um, we've got three sections, I think it's three sections, yeah, um, of Proverbs from Solomon, 
um, beginning in chapter one, chapter 10, chapter 25. Then you have the words of the wise, the words of Agor, words of Lemuel. And then, um, although possibly part of the words of Lemuel, you have the strong woman um, or the capable woman. I think somebody already mentioned this, um, that she's too busy, um, which we're, we're going to talk about her later. And yes, she, she's quite busy. Um, but this is all kind of how I would break it down. But really from chapter 10 on is structure somewhat breaks down because it's not like you have a whole bunch of uh, proverbs about money, followed by a whole bunch of proverbs about relationships, followed by a whole bunch of proverbs about um, justice. It's all scattered all throughout and it seems to be compiled more like an anthology. So let's look first at chapters one through nine. And of course, we're not going to be able to read much of it, but we are going to read all of chapter nine together when we get there. Um, so first of all, in talking about this, as I mentioned before, is this is multiple instructions from a father to a son. And when I mention instructions here, is that's usually a longer discourse than what you typically find later on. Um, and so that's going to have stuff uh, in there that says uh, kind of like a warning of, you need to listen to my instructions and a motive, because if you follow these other things, death is going to follow you, you're gonna end up impoverished and things like that. And then you'll get the actual instructions. Seek wisdom, uh, act justly, um, interact with people in a kind manner, work hard, those types of things. And so you'll see that type of language um, used in that little structure. Some of the topics that goes through this is it shows the dangers of not following the father's instructions. And so it'll be the dangers of pursuing violence. You know, when you see a gang of people and they say, let's lie and wait for blood, realize it's their own blood they're lying in wait for. Uh, you know, they're going to tie their own rope, so to speak. It talks about the dangers of greed, of lust, and the strange woman. Um, and what I don't like is I think in some of the translations, it'll have adulterous woman or the loose woman. That's what it says in uh, the New Revised Standard Version. Um, and then, of course, it puts a footnote that says the Hebrew means strange. Well, if the Hebrew means strange, put strange there. Don't put loose. That's not what it means. Um, and so it really seems to be kind of setting up, again, these two female characters, one personified by wisdom and the other personified by folly. Um, and there's conversation as to whether this strange woman in chapters one through eight is woman folly or lady folly in chapter nine. It, it almost doesn't matter. The, the way they're described is so similar that the point is made. Don't go after kind of easy love, so to speak, because putting in the hard work and doing it the right way leads to all these other benefits, if that makes sense. What you'll also have are speeches made by wisdom herself. And it shows the benefit of seeking out wisdom, what she offers. If you come towards wisdom, you will find wealth. You will find something more precious than gold. You will be given long life in the land. Um, you'll possess the land. You will have a woman, uh, a wife that you're proud of. You'll have children that obey you. You will be honored in the gates. You'll have a great reputation and all these different things. And so you've got this contrast of the benefits of seeking after wisdom contrasted with the dangers of going after the strange woman and all these other things that you potentially could pursue but shouldn't. When wisdom speaks, she speaks a lot like you hear God speak in the prophets. Turn your ear towards me. If only you would come after me, you would have these things. But if you reject what I say, here is what's going to happen to you. Turn your ears and hearken to my voice. I mean, it almost feels like a thus saith the Lord type thing um, that you would get in Jeremiah or Isaiah. And sometimes she's described a lot like Torah. If you will keep heed wisdom's call, you know, in the third person now, then you will receive long life in the land. Then you will receive riches. And it brings to my mind, if you're familiar with the blessings and curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28, you know, if you, uh, if you keep all the words of this covenant, then you will be blessed in the field and you'll be blessed in your home and in the fruit of your womb and so on. But if you don't keep my covenant, then you'll be cursed in the field and cursed in your home and cursed will be the fruit of your womb and so on. And one that's rather interesting is that wisdom describes herself as basically the prime creation of God. 
I was created before the foundations of the earth. And I was there when God created the animals and the sky and all of these things. By me, God did all of these things. And so you get the sense that wisdom is not just important, but is a creation, a facet of God that's been put out into the entire cosmos and in all of creation and really kind of bears witness to this. And yet if I was to summarize these nine chapters in just one brief thing, it's all, again, the value of wisdom over and against folly. And it really puts this out in a very pointed and kind of in-your-face kind of way. Because the point is, is this father wants his son not to be a knucklehead. Don't be an idiot. You know, and you can think of your own parents. Like, you know, when I was your age, here are the mistakes that I made. Don't do that. Don't do this stuff. Here's how you ought to live your life. This is the way that things ought to go and how you should pursue things. Does this make sense? No. So what I want to do is take a break real quick. And again, I was going to have us um, go into um, breakout sessions here. And I don't think we're going to need to do that given the size of our group. I'm going to stop if I can figure out how to stop sharing here. There we go. So I'll stop sharing that. And I want us to read all of Proverbs chapter 9 together. I'm not going to assume that you have a Bible with you, but if you do, plus 10 points, I guess. Um, but before we do that, are there questions at this point? No. Okay, so what I want to do, like I said, is have us read all of Proverbs, not chapter 10, chapter 9, um, here. And then I've got some questions for us to discuss about this. Um, so can I get two volunteers to read here? Thank you to all who are coming forward. <laughs> I will. Great. All right, Arlene, will you read, let's see, the um, up to verse 12, and then um, can I, Mildred, great. If you would pick up at verse 13 and read to the end. So Arlene, go ahead and take it away and I'll scroll down as, as you go. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Let's see. Verse seven. Seven, okay. Whoever corrects a scoffer wins abuse. Whoever rebukes the wicked gets hurt. A scoffer who is rebuked will only hate you. The wise, when rebuke, will love you. Give instruction to the wise, and they will become wiser still. Teach the, teach the righteous, and they will gain in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me, your days will be multiplied, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. Perfect. Thank you, Arlene. And then, Mildred, if you would start here in 13. Foolish woman is loud. She is ignorant and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the high places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. You who are simple, turn in here. And to those who without sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But they do not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of soul. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> now, we bring that up if, if need be. But I'm curious, what did you see maybe was similar? And it said foolish woman there. Um, I would translate it like Lady Folly and Lady Wisdom. So rather than a wise woman and a foolish woman, as I really feel like it's more personification of these things and these two women. How are they similar? What do they do that's similar? Is 
And again, I'm sure you memorized it from what was up on the screen. <laughs> I'm reading along as well, um, but because I'm a children's and youth minister, I have my um, English or common English Bible, kids Bible, and me too. Interesting in the translation is that both the wise woman and the foolish woman, or the woman of folly, invite the naive. Yes, like the word in the NRSV is a little bit different, but both of them are targeting um, a specific kind of person. Yeah. Yeah, and it's more or less the simple, which may or may not be a bad thing, but kind of if you think unlearned or ignorant in kind of the positive sense of, you know, I haven't studied physics, I'm ignorant in it, I want to learn. Um, and they both call out. Now, what does wisdom offer? What does folly offer? Wisdom offers bread and wine. Folly offered stolen water. So not quite as good. And yet they're both on the highest place in the city, um, kind of like you would have an old medieval church positioned on kind of the highest mound with the big steeple coming up so that you could see it. So she's standing up there, perhaps beside the temple or at the temple where you would come to find wisdom in all of this. And they're offering you very similar type things. Um, and they both look good. We both want these things. They're both beautiful. Which are you going to choose? And it all comes down to which are you going to choose? And so what, if you picked it up in the text, what do you get if you take what wisdom offers? I'll put you this get back to on. walk in the way of understanding. Yeah, you'll get understanding. Yeah, you'll be awakened there. And a long life. Long life, right? That's huge. Um, for by me, your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. Um, lay aside immaturity and live. Walk in the way of insight. Like these are very good things, right? But then you say, well, I, maybe I don't want that. Maybe woman folly is more beautiful. I'll go that direction. And what do you get there? Her guests are in the depths of Sheol. The dead are there. So you have these two very different paths and they lead to very different things. One leads to long life and life. The other basically leads to death. And Sheol, if, for those of you who don't know, is kind of like the place of the dead, um, almost like Hades in Greek mythology. It's like this is where all the dead souls will end up. And that's where folly is going to take you. So these first nine chapters basically promote um, what I and others have called um, the retribution principle. Hooray for big words. Retribution principle. And this really is the way that you want and almost expect the world to act. This is how things should be. The ideal, right? If somebody follows wisdom and they're good, they're righteous, they're just, they're generous, they're giving, they're intelligent and all of this, well, then they should get blessings. They should be rewarded with life, with wealth, with land, with good friends, a good reputation, a wonderful family. And then the people who are bad, those who pursue folly, they're wicked, they're selfish, they're unjust. They should get all the bad things and all the curses in life. Those are the ones who should die young, right? It shouldn't be only the good die young. It should be only the bad die young, right? They should be the ones who are impoverished who have no friends, um, whose families fall apart. And this is more or less what the book of Proverbs sets up, almost exclusively throughout the book. And what it doesn't talk about is when life does that, and you have wicked people with all the blessings, or when you have the good people with all the garbage. You know, and when I think about this, and when I was studying this in my doctoral work, is uh, the prime example at the time was Bernie Madoff, right? this horrible human being who scammed tons of good people out of their money, ends up so rich. Now, eventually he did come crumbling down, but that doesn't always happen. And we see people who don't get their just desserts. And so again, is what's going to end up happening is what we'll see in the book of Job is kind of this crisscross and what's going on with it and how to deal with that. But for now, this is what Proverbs 1 through 9 sets up. 
And again, if you go through not just chapter nine, which I think it culminates in chapter nine, but if you go through all those other uh, chapters one through eight, you'll see this as well all the way through. So that's the first section of the book. Second section, we'll go a little bit quicker through this perhaps. Um, this is where you get into what typically you think of perhaps when you think of the book of Proverbs. And so a Proverbs, as John McLaughlin, one of the uh, people I'd recommend uh, you read, uh, defines it, is a pithy, succinct, and memorable saying that has currency among the general population. It's almost widely accepted that this stuff is true, and we have a bazillion of them. Um, and when I teach this class at the university level, I always have my students take a moment and write down some of them. You know, given smartphones, the internet, computers, you know, you're probably not going to have a parable or a proverb based on farming. It's going to be on everyday experience, right? So what would you actually put in there? But, you know, we have a stitch in time saves nine. Um, no pain, no gain. Better late than never. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. It's all these different types of things, right? So just a couple of examples. And frequently there are two lines like this, sometimes not. But whoever gives to the poor will lack nothing, but who turns a blind eye will get many a curse. Right, this is something that you kind of want people to remember. So it's short, so it can stay in their mind. And the person who sees this, you know what? I would like to be in the position where I lack nothing. I think I'll be generous and give to the poor. That's the motivation behind this. Um, perhaps one that you might um, agree is perhaps even more true than this one, and this is a three-line one. Whoever blesses a neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as a cursing. Right? You, you're with a group of people on a retreat, on vacation. You finally get to sleep in, and that one happy person at 6 a.m. wakes you up. That's a cursing. That's in the book of Proverbs, right? Yeah, I say amen to that one, right? So with all of this, this is kind of what they look like. They're short, they're terse, they're memorable. And so I call this section of the book a bit, uh, perhaps irreverently, the divinely inspired book of fortune cookies. Because that's really how they feel, is they're so short, you could print them on a fortune cookie, turn them over, you get your lucky numbers, and you're good to go. Looking at some of the topics that are in here. Ooh, where did it go? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my sheet wrong. So strategies for reading this, because like I said, is it can be rather difficult because they're so scattered and it's not organized. Is one, just read a chapter at a time. Don't try and read the whole thing. I know a lot of people who will actually read one chapter a day for a month because there's basically 31 days and there's 31 chapters. Pick out one or two topics that are important to you and focus on them, maybe memorize them. Realize these things are not promises. Perhaps there is that group that likes the happy person at 6 a.m. So you need to interact with these things and apply them. This isn't kind of a, you know, you look at it, you memorize it, you do what it says, and you get the outcome you want as if it's a magic formula or something like that. And you need to think about specific situations where they apply because they might not. And a great example of this comes down to this. Don't answer fools according to their folly or you will be a fool yourself, right? Don't stoop to their level. Then you're just being a nincompoop just like they are. But you know what the next verse says? Answer fools according to their folly or they will be wise in their own eyes, right? Get down on their level, show them how dumb they're being and that will change their mind. Well, which is it? Do I answer fools according to their folly or not? Yes, right? The answer is yes, but it depends on who you're interacting with, what the situation is, and how you, what you want to get out of it. And you've kind of, kind of got to know these things. And so having both of these proverbs in your mind are important. Getting down to specific content um, that's in here is, um, we've already mentioned this uh, early on, is the fear of the Lord. And this is a hugely important uh, concept in Proverbs, but even outside of Proverbs, it's all over the place. Um, but here as it's told, you know, it's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's mentioned 17 times throughout the book. It's frequently put in opposition to evil. So fear the Lord, resist evil, and it gives life, which is awesome. That sounds great. I want this stuff. But what the heck is it? Right? I want, I want to fear the Lord. You've convinced me this is good. What exactly is it? Um, and I think it's not 
terror. It's not being afraid as if God's hovering his hand over the smite button, just waiting for you to mess up and, bzz, and then that's it. It's more of a reverence, a respect, an awe towards God, or as one of my favorite biblical scholars of all time would say, it's the equivalent of biblical religion and piety, and in the context of Proverbs, of proper moral behavior, right? It's perhaps Jesus might summarize this as love God, love neighbor. That's the fear of the Lord is doing these types of things and being in this proper relationship, both with how you um, interact with God, but then that spills over to how you interact with other people. And so as you go through Proverbs and you see this, you can kind of get the sense of, you know what, you know, a proper relationship with God and with other people, that's where wisdom ought to start. Perhaps not chronologically, but at least as the basis of things and how I interact with people. So you've got that. Um, I'm going to put together some slides with lots of text on it, but we're not going to go through all of this, but just to see Proverbs about money. And again, as it's scattered all over the place, and what's somewhat interesting about these is some of them basically kind of tell you just the way things are. So right there in the middle of the screen, the poor are disliked even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. Right? And of course, it's not telling you, well, is poor better or is rich better? But it's kind of, you know what? This is the way it is. Um, one of my heroes growing up, the, the greatly esteemed MC Hammer, um, he made a great fortune with all of his music, and then he mismanaged his money. He gave a lot of money away to friends who were in need, and when he had nothing, everybody left him, right? And it's so tragic and so sad, and it's kind of that's the way the world works. So maybe it's just you need to know the way that this is. Um, but then you have like the wealth of the rich is their fortress. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. Well, it sounds like rich is better, but you know what? That fortress comes crumbling because those who trust in their riches will wither, but the righteous will flourish. And so you've got all these different things about money scattered throughout the book. Other examples of just um, some random proverbs to bring out here is on laziness. And so we've got our awesome sloth here. Um, and it says all sorts of things about the need to be hardworking and not to be lazy and slack. There's a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Work hard, do the things you need to do. Um, I like uh, 1026, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so are the lazy to their neighbors or to their employers, right? And we all work with that one person, but we've all been in a group project with that one person who doesn't do their fair share of things. And you want to pour vinegar in their eyes <laughs> or something like that. Like, just do your job. Um, and then here you can see, you know, go to the ant, you lazy bones and so on. I also like 1924, the lazy person buries his hand in the dish, but won't even bring it back to their mouth. They're too tired. It's, it's too much work to actually pick the corn up off the plate. Um, I'm too tired. Proverbs on justice. Justice is a big theme throughout the book of Proverbs. Um, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And again, that's a common theme throughout the Psalms, a common theme throughout uh, the, the books of prophecy, uh, because Israel um, is depicted in its own scriptures as people who said, we've got the temple, we make the sacrifices, and we do all of these things. And then they're chided for exporting the poor, taking advantage of widows and orphans, mistreating the foreigner. And God says, no, you need to do righteousness. You need to be just in treatment with things. A fair balance is an abomination to the Lord, but an accurate weight is his delight. Right? Fairness is really important to God. And keeping these things in mind, hopefully remembering that will help me in my dealings be fair and honest and full of integrity with other people. When justice is done, it's a joy to the righteous, but it's dismay to evildoers. And my goodness, haven't we seen that in the past year? Um, when justice is finally done, the gavel comes down and the right verdict is given. And then you see those who would be evildoers get upset about it. But it's a joy to those who wanted justice in the first place, who wanted to see what was right in all of this. And then finally, I'll turn to Rosie the Riveter here for the mighty woman of Proverbs uh, 31. And you may have heard her of a capable wife um, or a, a noble woman or something like that. But what's fascinating is the Hebrew word that describes her is chayil, 
which means strong, mighty, and powerful. This is a word that is used throughout the, the Bible to describe God, to describe champions, soldiers, and even entire armies. So you might have King Saul afraid because the chayil of the Philistines is on the horizon. It's rare to be used of a woman in the Old Testament, and so it's worth paying attention. Now, this woman is depicted doing the things that would be stereotypical for her to do at the time. You know, she serves and brings honor to her husband. She provides food and sews clothing, and she cares for her children. All fine and good stuff, nothing wrong with that, but it, like I said, it's, it's stereotypical. Nothing surprising here. However, she also does these things. She manages her servants. She's the one who's in charge. She buys a field. She plants the vineyard. She girds herself with strength, and I love this, makes her arms strong. Um, you know, and I did image searches for this, and you just get, you know, women just weightlifting all of this stuff. Like, I mean, it's Rosie the Riveter. Like, you don't want to mess with this woman. She's selling merchandise, and she knows she can make a profit for it, and yet she gives to the poor, and she fears the Lord. This is a woman to be admired, not because she's a good wife, but because she's almost an ideal human being and somebody that we should all aspire to be like. And she's doing things that are quite progressive and somewhat liberating for the time. And it's described not of a man, but of a woman. It's truly fascinating. And this is how the book ends. And so you have wisdom personified as a woman all throughout. And then the book ends by having this mighty woman finish the whole thing up. And I am running out of time, so I'll fly through my takeaways here. But just going through things, some of the stuff that's fascinating as you read through the book of Proverbs is that God's wisdom is everywhere, especially in creation. You see trees, the skies, birds, cows, whatever it is, God's wisdom is everywhere. And if it doesn't look like it is, it's probably because somebody messed it up. And that's on us. <laughs> Thus, we should fear the Lord because he is the only wise God. To him alone be glory and honor. We should fear him and be in that right relationship with him and with the people around them. And we do that by pursuing a life of wisdom in our work, in our families, in our societies, with our friends, in all of our relationships. I'd encourage you to engage with, apply, discuss, debate, argue against, argue for, and memorize individual proverbs. Because that'll help you think through and apply things in different ways and keep them in there. I think for we as Christians, since this is in our Bible as well, is to see that Jesus Christ is the embodiment of wisdom. First Corinthians says that, right? So you want to see what a wise person looks like, according to scripture? Look at Jesus. And if you were to describe Jesus by one word, wouldn't that be, word, be love? Right? And so it almost makes love the highest form of wisdom. Love of God and love for, for neighbor, right? Everything Jesus does is love. You want to see what true love is like? Don't go to the Hallmark Channel. Go to Jesus. That's what love looks like. And I think even this book here in the Old Testament, written at least a thousand, you know, started compiling at least a thousand years before Christ, is pointing us in that direction of seeing Jesus as being the embodiment and the ultimate of what uh, wisdom would be, and that's expressed best in love. So those are some of my takeaways. I've got all this in the handout as well, um, and I guess I'll turn off the fire hydrant now. Um, and we're at eight o'clock. I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know if Rowan's got to kick us off or what we've got to do. Um, nope, questions are fine. Thoughts, comments, anything? All right, well, hearing none, if you do have anything, feel free to email me. Um, Next week, we'll look at the book of Job. If you have a chance to read the first nine chapters of Proverbs, I think that would actually be helpful as we move into Job. Um, reading the first two or three chapters of Job would also be helpful. Pick and choose. Do it all. Do, it, do none of it. It doesn't matter. Um, but I've had fun. I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, if there's anything you'd recommend we change for a future uh, session, send me an email. Because if, if you're falling asleep and are bored, that's no use to anybody. Um, so let me know what, uh, what, what you would... Uh, find helpful. Otherwise, God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm.